immediately activated the imminent danger notification system. State Department official Charlene Lamb was working that night in Washington, and so she could follow the events in real time. He also alerted the quick reaction security team stationed nearby, the Libyan 17th February Brigade, the embassy in Tripoli, and the Diplomatic Security Command Center in Washington. Back here in the main residence, the special agent, reportedly David Ubin, comes here and gets Ambassador Stevens from his bedroom and brings him, along with Sean Smith, to this room in the safe haven. Really, aside from some medicine and other supplies, a big, dark, windowless closet. And then, outside, a locked gate. Hope for security. Ubin radios the others in the compound to say they are fine. The other security agents are scrambling amidst the gunfire and explosions, gathering up their machine guns, body armor, and ammunition from the other buildings. As two of them head back to the main residence, they're cut off by a large group of armed men. They decide to go back and barricade themselves in. At this point, there are seven Americans at three different locations, Ambassador Stevens and two others in the main residence, two special agents at the second residence and cafeteria, and then here in the Tactical Operations Center, two more agents. Attackers all around. One group penetrates the small residence. The attackers, however, don't get to the agents, and they eventually leave. Inside the main residence, it is a different story. Attackers come in here, and they ransack the place, and then they go for the locked gate. They look inside. It's dark. They can't see anything. And then they try the lock. They can't open it up. Inside, Agent Ubin has got a gun trained on them, ready to shoot if need be. But, as Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Wood says, the safe haven is only safe for a short time. It's a delay for an aggressor, um, but it has to rely on someone to come in to, uh, to rescue him as well. That someone, Wood says, might have been his elite site security team, but they've been pulled out of the country. Either way, Stevens, Smith, and Ubin were trapped by diabolical killers who pour diesel fuel around the house, light it, and leave. When we come back, the trapped Americans try desperately to escape. Before the break, Greg Palcott told you how terrorists overran the U.S. consulate compound in Benghazi, Libya. A handful of Americans caught by surprise, pinned down in three different locations. Three of those people, including Ambassador Chris Stevens, have locked themselves in a so-called safe haven constructed in one of those buildings. The attackers can't break in, so they've set the place ablaze. Once again, from Benghazi, here's Greg Palka. September 11th, around 10 p.m., the entire safe haven, which takes up part of the first floor of the main residence, is black with thick smoke and fumes. Ambassador Stevens, Sean Smith, and David Ubin move to a bathroom within the safe area, which has a window. They try to open it, but it doesn't help. There's just too much smoke. They drop to the floor, trying to get air, but even down there, they can't breathe. So they decide to leave the safe haven and take their chances with the armed attackers who have taken over the U.S. compound. Fighting the heat and smoke, they find another window grill they can open. This is the window that Special Agent Ubin jimmies open and crawls out of, but Stevens and Smith do not crawl out after him. And so, even though he can barely see, barely breathe, he goes back in. In fact, he goes back in and out several times. He can't find them, and he is overcome with smoke. Ubin struggles up a small ladder to the roof of the building and collapses. He radios the other agents. Another U.S. agent in full combat gear emerges from the Tactical Operations Center. Throwing a smoke grenade to hide his movements, he moves to the small residence and gets the two agents holed up there out. The three then get into an armored vehicle parked nearby and drive the short distance to the large residence. Taking turns, they crawl into the residence on their hands and knees, feeling their way through the building to try to find their two colleagues. They find Smith. They pull him out of the building. He's dead. Now remember, the crack site security team is gone, but there's a small unit of security at the annex a mile away. Six Americans and 16 from the Libyan militia arrive. Some surround the compound. The others go in. They're unable to find Stevens. By 11, the Libyan forces say they can no longer hold the perimeter. The American agents carrying Smith's body pile into an armored vehicle and exit the main gate. They head for the annex about a mile away. The crowd fires upon them and throws two grenades under their vehicle. They take direct fire from AK-47s from about two feet away. 
Despite two flat tires and heavy damage to their vehicle, they keep rolling. Several blocks away, they hit more traffic in a busy Benghazi neighborhood. The car careens over the middle divider, pushes forward against opposing traffic, and finally makes it to the annex and again hope for safety. Sometime after midnight, back at the mission, looters enter the building and find the body of Stevens slumped on the floor. Although they don't know who he is, they drag him out through a window. His eyes are dazed, his face smoke-stained, seemingly lifeless. When someone says he's breathing, the crowd is relieved and cheer. Allah Akbar, God is great. Around 1 a.m., Ambassador Stevens is brought by car here to the Benghazi Medical Center, where doctors try desperately to resuscitate him for some 45 minutes. They fail. He dies of severe asphyxiation. Back at the annex, the battle is on again. Fighters hitting the place with AK-47 fire and rocket-propelled grenades, forcing those inside to retreat to a building further back in the annex compound. Sometime after 1.30 at the Benghazi airport, a team of reinforcements arrives from the U.S. Embassy in Tripoli. They make their way to the annex. According to reports, they were going into an ambush. Around 4 a.m., this annex compound is hit by another wave of attacks. It is described as planned and precise. A round of mortar fire targeting the roof of a building set well behind this gate. That turns out to be dangerous and deadly. Killed in that attack, two security personnel, Glenn Doherty, 42, and Tyrone Woods, 41, both former Navy SEALs. Badly injured, Special Agent David Ubin, the same man who struggled valiantly to save the lives of Ambassador Stevens and Information Manager Smith. The fighters are repelled. The annex, reportedly a base of operations for sensitive intelligence work tracking militants in eastern Libya, is secured. And a decision is made to evacuate the whole enterprise. 8.30 a.m. September 12th. The second plane leaves with the remaining Americans on board and the bodies of Ambassador Stevens, Smith, and Agents Doherty and Woods. It's less than a month since the military site security team left the country to the regret of its commander, Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Wood, who says they would have made a difference. It was the job of the SST to protect the ambassador should something like that happen. It was our job to defend the compound and engage those targets until he could be extracted. Chris Stevens was the first U.S. ambassador killed on duty in more than three decades. September 11, 2012, was a tragedy that will long be remembered. Then the story moved back to Washington. Was what followed the fog of war, an attempted cover-up, or something else? Special Report investigates after the break. The carnage in Benghazi is over. The story shifts to Washington. Here's Chief White House correspondent Ed Henry. Since our founding, the United States has been a nation that respects all faiths. We reject all efforts to denigrate the religious beliefs of others. September 12th, in the Rose Garden, President Obama seems to embrace an idea he and his top aides will advance more explicitly over the next two weeks, that Ambassador Chris Stevens and three other Americans were killed in a spontaneous riot over an anti mohammed Internet video and not a planned attack. He does use the term terror, but only in a general sense, in the context of the September 11, 2001 Al-Qaeda attacks. No acts of terror will ever shake the resolve of this great nation, alter that character, or eclipse the light of the values that we stand for. He gives an interview to CBS's 60 Minutes shortly thereafter. He says nothing that has happened has made him second-guess his policies in the Middle East since the uh, Arab Spring. I, I was pretty certain and continue to be pretty, pretty certain that uh, there are going to be bumps in the road. Because. Nevada is a battleground state. That afternoon, the president leaves for a campaign trip to Las Vegas. The president of the United States did not postpone a campaign event, even though we had been hit. I said at the time, I thought that that was the biggest political strategic mistake of the Obama campaign. Dana Perino was the White House press secretary in George W. Bush's administration. She's now a Fox News host. Just imagine if he would have said, as commander in chief, it is important for me to stay back here at the White House. Just imagine, everybody thought, wow, how responsible. Once the president had made his statement, uh, I'm not sure what he should have done. Democrat Eleanor Holmes Norton represents the District of Columbia. Are we supposed to sit in mourning uh, for several days and not go about our daily business? September 13th, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton suggests the attack 
was just a spontaneous demonstration about the anti-Islam video. There is no justification, none at all for responding to this video with violence. Current White House Press Secretary Jay Carney says so flat out the next day. These protests were in reaction to a video. We have no uh, information to suggest that it was a pre-planned uh, attack. And later that day, when the President and Secretary of State greet the deceased at Joint Base Andrews, Clinton talks again about the video. We've seen rage and violence directed at American embassies over an awful internet video that we had nothing to do with. September 15th, California authorities haul Nikula Basili Nikula, the man who produced that video, in for questioning and marched him in front of TV cameras. Do you have any regrets? September 16th, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Susan Rice, goes on five Sunday talk shows repeating the same story each time. What happened initially was that it was a spontaneous uh, reaction to what had just transpired in Cairo uh, as a consequence of the video. My reaction was, where's Secretary of State Hillary Clinton? To John Bolton, who served as UN ambassador under George W. Bush, the choice of Rice is telling. From my own experience, when you're a senior American uh, official, you don't go on the Sunday talk shows unless you're the White House choice. So that, that to me is an indication that uh, there were already internal difficulties within the administration uh, and that perhaps Secretary Clinton wasn't seen by the White House uh, as the best spokesperson for what the administration wanted to say. September 17th, the State Department. Does the United States government regard what happened in Benghazi as a t an act of terror? Again, I'm not going to put labels on this until we have a complete investigation, okay? You don't, so you don't regard it as an act of terrorism? I don't think we know enough. I don't think we know enough. From my experience, former Obama State Department spokesman P.J. Crowley. First reports <laughs> inevitably um, uh, have uh, information that is correct and information that may be uh, uh, misunderstood or, or incorrect. They panicked. They panicked. Former White House Chief of Staff John Sununu is now a senior advisor to Republican Mitt Romney's campaign. This is purely a political reaction in a White House that had prepared itself to establish a narrative of a president getting rid of the threat of terrorism, using the death of bin Laden to focus on that, and waking up one morning and finding out that terrorism on 9-11 of this year was back full-fledged and even killing a U.S. ambassador. I don't see a political agenda uh, here. I see the fog of war. It's not about politics. It's, it's about the difficult task of reconstructing uh, what happened. September 18th. Did the administration have any sort of heads up that violence was increasing specifically in Libya before the attack? I'm not aware of any, Ed. This is a matter that's under investigation in terms of what precipitated the attacks, what the motivations of the attackers were. That night on The Late Show with David Letterman, the story seems to shift slightly. President Obama says the video did spark Muslim outrage, which terrorists then exploited to attack and kill Ambassador Stevens. You had a video that was released by uh, somebody who lives here, uh, sort of a shadowy character. This caused great offense uh, in much of the Muslim world, uh, but what also happened was extremists and terrorists uh, used this as an excuse uh, to uh, attack uh, a variety of our embassies, including the one, uh, the consulate in, in Libya. September 19th, Capitol Hill. The head of the National Counterterrorism Center testifies and plainly states what most everyone already knows. And I would say yes, uh, they were killed in the course of a terrorist attack on our embassy. September 24th, ABC's The View. There's no doubt that the kind of weapons that were used, uh, the, the ongoing assault, uh, that it wasn't just a mob action. The next day, September 25th, the president mentions the video six times at the United States.